show them where to look, but not show them what to look at. Hey, this is the curriculum. You decide what part of it you want to take on. I'll guide you. I'll be a guide in the background. What exactly is the Montessori philosophy? We unpack agency, the prepared environment, and how you can get your parents on board. It gives students absolute freedom to choose, and you have this confidence building in every child on their own personal journey. In today's episode, we talk to Australia's ambassador for Montessori, Gavin McCormick. The School Leaders Project is brought to you by Toddle, your all-in-one teaching and learning platform made for teachers and by teachers. Toddle started as a passion project in a school that thought that teaching tech should be as innovative as teaching teams. We're now loved by more than 1,500 progressive K-12 schools all around the world. Without further ado, let's jump into my conversation with Gavin McCormick. And so then I became a Montessori teacher, which is ultimate agency, which is ultimate uh-huh. freedom, ultimate independence. And then I um, had my own school as a school principal for five years when I had a preschool and a primary school. Then I became the Montessori ambassador for Australia. And um, and now I'm running an online school for hundreds of thousands of children around the world with this same mindset of uh, open agency, freedom, choice, and purpose. And what am I most passionate about, as your question, is all of those things encompassed, uh, everything included. Just basically working hard and trying my best to make a dent in what I see as a kind of broken education system that's not designed for tomorrow, even today. And so uh, I guess that's why we're here to talk, which is quite exciting. The reason I landed hmm. on Montessori was actually not my my doing. Yeah. Uh, an inspector came in from the government to inspect our school randomly. And it's a spot inspection, so they just turn up and they walk into school and they just go into classes. This lady called Sue Bremner, I'll never forget her name. She was in my class and she was watching my lesson. And I was petrified because I was new to teaching and I've been doing a few years. And I was doing something quite abstract. I had kids who were taking slots in the curriculum and teaching the curriculum to us. And I was, when she walked in, I was sitting in a child's chair and a nine-year-old boy from Afghanistan wearing an abaya and holding the Quran was telling us about his journey, what he'd seen, what he'd been through and what his culture was like. Cool. And that was the way we ran it. When they wanted their slot, I'd take their seat and I'd listen and I'd study and I'd be like a student and they would take their reins. And I'd help them plan the lesson and do their presentation and everything. But she, at the end of it, uh, she asked me to go and talk to her on the playground. We sat on a bench together and we had a conversation. And she said, you know, um, can you tell me what's happening in your room? And I said, look, you know what I just told you? I said, these students have got a lot to share and a lot. I've got a lot to learn from them. And also... They've got a lot of trauma and I want to give them a chance to have a voice and voice let the other children know it's okay to speak about these things. And when you speak about them, everyone realizes, goodness me, it's okay for me to talk about my trauma too and what I've been through and how I feel. And anyway, I told her this and she, she started welling up and she said, you know what, I think. And I said, no, and she, I thought she was going to say, this is a terrible lesson. You should be fired. <laughs> this is a disaster. She said, I think you're a Montessori teacher, but you don't know it yet. Montessori has this whole attitude and philosophy of independence and she says follow the child what she means is not literally follow them around but you've got to basically show them where to look but not show them what to look at like hey this Mm. is the curriculum you decide what part of it you want to take on i'll guide you i'll be a guide in the background and i love that mindset because it gives students absolute freedom to choose and you have this 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 confidence building in every child that they are on their own personal journey, following their own niche and discovering who they really are. But it's actually inside the curriculum. <laughs> so it sits still inside the curriculum. You're not, you're not stepping outside of the parameters there. Uh, but children are fully um, enthralled by what they're learning because they believe, and it's true, that they have choice over what happens to them when they come to school. So if you look at curriculums and you have like English, math, science, above all of that, at the very top of the hierarchy, she had world peace. And mm. so she said that in every lesson that you teach children, you must have this question that's being asked of the child or you as the teacher. What about this lesson? What about the work that you have produced is going to make the world better? And if you can't answer that question, then A, you shouldn't be teaching it, and B, the sh- student shouldn't be engaging in that work. So if this doesn't make the world a little bit better by what you are about to do, we're not doing it. I'm so sorry. Because the ultimate objective when all humans are kind of working towards this common goal is the world becomes more peaceful. So, for example, you've got two children in your class and you're studying, uh, let's say you're studying plants, okay, as part of your curriculum, which everyone studies botany in the entire right. world. In a Montessori classroom, what would happen is you might have one child who says, I want to draw a picture of a lily. It's my grandma's favorite um, plant and I want to color it in I'll paint it and take it home and give it to her to make her smile 
now. The teacher says, yes, that's all good because the world gets a little bit better because grandma smiled. That's fine. But the other end of the spectrum, you've got a little group of children, maybe five or six, and they've decided that they want to plant a forest. They want to do a fundraiser, write to local newspapers, raise $20,000, buy some land and plant an entire forest in the hope of bringing a native bird to their location. So, and they succeed, for example, or they both fail, it doesn't matter. But yeah. the objective was clear that both of those were going to make the world better. And they were on a, they were on a spectrum of, of, mm. you know, of engagement and work. And in the Montessori environment, all of those things are accepted. It doesn't matter which one you choose. The learning outcome is still ticked. You still learn about plants because the teacher still had to do some direct teaching, some inspiration, but it's the work that's different. Because I think a lot of teachers, then we see our curriculum and then we feel kind of boxed in. So how do you consistently make that space for student choice and, and passion? This is a pretty cool story, actually, uh, where uh, I came with a plan to change the school. And so it wasn't about talking to the teachers, wasn't about writing the curriculum, wasn't about doing anything else. It was about the parents. Okay. What the parents want teachers deliver because that's what happens. That's right. You know how it works, right? And um, so I got all the parents systematically over a period of two days to visit this grand hall. And I had about a thousand parents at a time in this big hall. And they're all sitting there and uh, they're all in couples, most of them. And so I, I said, look, before we begin today's workshop, it's going to be two hours. We're going to do a bit of a warm up activity. And I said, look on the big screen, you'll see 20 things that all great parents do. Right. I've done my research. This is 20 things that great parents do. Have a look at them and have a conversation with your husband and wife and give yourself a ranking out of five. Do we do well at that or do we not do so? well? So the first one was I read with my child every single day. Number two was um, I walk at a child's pace. I do not rush them along the way. Number three was um, when my child is telling me a story, I listen until they have finished speaking before I interrupt. Right. Anyway, so I put them up and off they went. And this huge cacophony of noise happened in the, in the grand hall and they're all chatting. And I overheard one couple and he was, he said, I'm definitely a five to his wife about reading every night. She said, you're not a five. You're two euros on your iPhone. And they had this argument. It was really funny. And, uh, at the end of this 10 minutes, they'd all done their summary of what they were. And I said, now add up your scores, everybody. And I saw one guy's face look at me and he knew what I was about to do. I was going to rank them. Right. Oh. Yeah. And so they added their scores. And I said, look, okay, before we start, uh, what I'd like you to do is if you've got 70 to 100, I want you to stand up and stand on this side of the hall. If you've got zero to 30, I want this side of the hall. And if 40 to 70, you're in the middle. So they reluctantly went to the hall. And I said, over here on the right hand side, you're the best parents in this community. You're the creme de la creme. We should applaud you. Well done. And we clapped and everyone kind of reluctantly clapped. It was really <laughs> awkward. And I said at the bottom over here, you're the worst parents in the community. In fact, I'm surprised your children are even still alive. You're so bad at parenting. It's shocking. And then I know one dad wanted to kind of fight me, but it was fine. And in the middle group, uh, I said, look, you, you guys, are, we don't really care about you. You're just gray. You're not good. You're not bad. So we just ignore you. We won't even say anything about you. Now come and sit down. They all came and sat down. And I said, how do you, how do you feel? And one guy put his hand up and said, I was in the top group, but I feel ashamed. And I said, ashamed. You're the best. You're the gray day, the 100%, the creme de la creme. You should be happy. He said, I'm ashamed because I feel sorry for everybody else. And I said, and that's what this school is doing right now. This school grades every child and we have a, a ducks of the year and we, we tell the parents who is the best and who is the worst. And this happens in the classrooms. This happens everywhere. I said, we need to change it because you can see it doesn't work. And then we changed it because the parents wanted it. They realized immediately that what they were doing and what they wanted out of this system was wrong. Even the people who were wow. getting grade A's were failing. And so then you transform the classroom after that. And it's about then saying, well, the parents trust you now, teachers. So you won't need to answer any questions anymore about grade A's, points, scores, percentages. You can actually teach what you love. So now look at the curriculum, look at the outcomes. And if it says birds, you find a bird you love. You find a picture of you with a bird or a time when you saw a bird or a bird. And then you teach the children, starting with inspiration. And then you tell the children, now, what would you like to know about birds? And let them write their own curriculum and set them free in the classroom for an hour. Well, you watch them practice. You watch those skills taking part. They will come to feedback after an hour. They'll show you their work. They'll teach you. They'll show you what they've learned. They'll work in groups. They'll work on the floor. They'll talk. They'll communicate. And you might just do this once a week at the beginning because it's new to you. But after a while, it's the only thing your kids will want to do. And it's the only thing you'll want to do. 
I wonder if you might also talk in the Montessori environment. I'm always in awe of the prepared spaces. Um, you know, and I think, I think of, you know, the pink tower and again, all the kind of younger years things. But might you talk a little bit about how the space is designed in Montessori? Going back to your question about the prepared environment, each of the areas of the room is designed to match a certain subject. So you have a literacy area, a mathematics area, a sensorial area, practical life area. You have all these different areas in the room mm -hmm. and they're filled with materials and they're all tangible. So you can touch them, you can feel them, you can pick them up. Everything is tangible because as we know, and this is not just Montessori, but this comes from neuroscience and, and you know lots of research out of Harvard and MIT and multiple universities. The hand literally is the gateway to the brain. What you touch, you will remember. There's just no question about that. There's so many nerves in your hand. It's just a pathway to your brain is just so direct that if you can touch it, then you'll learn it. So the prepared environment means that everything, everything in the room you can touch. Number two is it's, it's a sacred place where everything has a place. So if your students take something and use it at the table, they must put it back and they must put it back where they found it because somebody else is going to want to use that. And if it's trashed or out of place or it's not, you know, um, taken care of, then your fellow colleagues, your teammates, your peers, your classmates will be stifled in their learning. And that builds this responsibility and empathy to the people in my room. But the, the real genius of it is that Everything is available all the time. There's no questions of the teacher. Can I use the card? Can I move tables? Can I sit on the floor? Can I go in the cupboard? Can I go to the toilet? Can I use the scissors? Can I use the iPad? Can I, can I, can I, can I? That question never appears because the answer is always yes. It's always yes. There are some rules like you can't climb out the window and run off. That's one thing you can't do. But Fair. <laughs> yeah, you can do everything else um, because this is your classroom and it's mine too. And so I own it as much as you do. But beware that if you break something, if you run with the scissors, if you use all the card, if you pour the paint on the carpet, that we're all going to have to deal with the fallout of that. So be mm. careful. Now, what happens straight away is children, and this sounds scary for lots of teachers, especially mainstream teachers who are like, oh, my God, they'll just, you know, I'll never control them. Um, but when you've got some guidelines in the room, um, then children work really effectively. And when they know the responsibility is theirs upon everybody else, uh, then it's great. But what's really cool about it is you allow them to make mistakes. And that's how the world works, right? That if you have a responsible to the people around you and a responsibility uh, and you let them down in some way, or you make them happy or you do something good, then you feel something for that. And so having a room that resembles what society looks like outside is actually what she did. Because you're going to ask your children to step into the real world. The real world is not sitting in rows with fingers on lips, putting your hand up to go to the toilet. The real world, when you get a job at Google or SpaceX or Tesla or one of these amazing you know, companies, the real world is not that. The real world is nobody will be managing you. They'll give you a project and say, hey, by the way, Cindy, the deadline's the 3rd of March. Here's your team. Here's your resources. You've got $6 million. See you then. <laughs> so, you know, mm -hmm. that's the real world. That's what we're walking into now. That's the future. Well, that's now. And so she predicted that. And she said, let's make our classrooms resemble the real world. So as a teacher, you've got, you can either be a product-driven teacher or a process-driven teacher, right? Mm -hmm. So a product-driven teacher is very common. And in fact, I've been a product-driven teacher previously, and I'm ashamed to say it, but I luckily saw the light. A product-driven teacher does this. Let's say, Cindy, you're teaching your children about, and you've been learning the food chain, and it's Today, you're going to do some arts and craft uh, based on your food chain, and it's about mice. Everyone's going to make a mouse, right? Because this week, you've read a book about a mouse, and I don't know, blah, 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 right? A product-driven teacher does this. While the kids are at recess, she sets up every table with a gray circle, two googly eyes, a pink dot, a piece, six pieces of string that are cut to exactly three centimeters, a glue stick. And when the kids come in, she says, hi, guys, we're going to make a mouse in art today. And the kids go, yay, I can't wait to make a mouse. Everybody take your gray circle and put the pink dot in the middle. That's your nose. Everyone does it. Now get your googly eyes, guys. I'm going to stick mine on. You stick yours on. Now get your mm -hmm. piece of string that I cut for you. Now put them on. Now every kid goes home that day with a mouse that looks like a mouse, right? Zero agency, zero choice, zero freedom, zero confidence building, zero skills, a recipe. The teacher may as well just made 30 mice herself and gave them to the kids. kids Here, go take home. this home. <laughs> yeah. And they hand them to their mum. And then mum says, oh, my 
goodness me, that's a beautiful mouse. I can't believe you made this little Tommy. And Tommy says, Mom, I'm so good. Boy, you can have an extra time tonight on your iPad or whatever the, whatever it is, right? The next day she comes to school and she says to the teacher, by the way, you're an amazing teacher, Cindy. I can't believe my child made that mouse. It's remarkable. Thank you so much, you know, Mrs. Johnson. It's really nice to hear those positive words. Product-driven teacher. Process-driven teacher. Hi, guys. We've been learning about mice this week, as you know. Uh, now, I've made a mouse because uh, I, I, I've i made one as an example. Uh, I made it at lunchtime while you were at recess. Uh, check it out. And the kids go, whoa, that's cool. And the teacher says, you can work wherever you want. You can work with whom you wish. You can access every single material in this room. But in one hour's time, we're going to meet on the carpet and you're going to show us your mice and you're going to tell us how you made it. Off you go, guys. Bye. Gone. Every kid's gone. Some kids are working on the floor. Some kids are making the papier-mâché. Some kids are drawing. Some kids are writing. Some kids are doing it on an iPad. Everyone's making a mouse and they all look different. Some of them don't even look like mice. And when they go home that day and they share it with their mum, their mum says, ooh, it's oh, more like a dog. Why's it got three legs? You know, why's it got six eyes? And the child says, well, you know, it's my mouse. So I can do what I want. My mind told me to make this mouse and that's what I'm doing. So you have to accept it. Next day, the parent comes to the teacher and says, by the way, I'm slightly concerned about what's happening in your class, Mrs. Johnson. What do you mean? Uh, well, my child came home and said, he's looking at mice, but the mice he brought home looked like a, a dog. It had three legs and la, la, la. And the teacher says, well, in our school, we actually promote inclusivity, uh, choice, freedom, agency. As we know, so Ken Robinson told us that creativity is the one thing that we need to focus on with children. And that was this process because art is all about creativity. That's what your child chose to deliver. And therefore, that's what you see. And teachers, the parent says, wow, OK, thank you so much. And so you have these two mindsets, right? But I would say, and this is going to be a sweeping statement, a lot of us go down the product-driven approach, textbooks, worksheets. It's always the same for every kid. You're going to write this. You're going to do that. I'm going to tell you what you're going to do. It doesn't work. It's, it's a problem. We have to shift to this process-driven approach, and we see this holistic approach to education. Recently, um, a friend of mine and I, Richard Mills, if he's listening, and he definitely will be, uh, in 2020, we opened a school online, a free school for children to come to school because it was the pandemic. I was in my Montessori school here in Manly and I was doing remote learning as everybody was around the world. Mm. By this time, I had about 20,000 followers on LinkedIn or something. I've got 100,000 now, but I had about 20,000 at that point. And the whole world was teaching remotely. In fact, India was closed. There was no school, right? So I was preparing these lessons for the students in my school and I was sending a, a link out to my 20 or 30 kids, right, in my class uh, when I was school principal. And I thought, you know, this is a, what a waste. I've got a link here with a lesson that I've spent all night preparing on, on pollination. Why don't I just put the link on LinkedIn and see who comes? Cool. And say, free class today. Click the link. 14,000 people turned up to that lesson. In, in teams. And then I quit my job uh, at school. <laughs> I went to my board and I said, I'm leaving. And I said, why? And I said, look, I have to do this other thing. I've realized something that's missing out in the world. And so me and Richard Mills have been talking about this, this kind of dream of doing something cool. And so then I quit and we stepped out into the world and we opened UpSchool, so UpSchool.co. And basically we started uh, delivering lessons to children around the world for free and see who'd come. And to this point now, we have hundreds of thousands of children in almost every single country, right? We have ambassadors from all over the world. We have whole school networks in India with 200,000 kids. Sign up every kid, right? All coming. But it's morphed a bit. So what was before teaching live is now pre-recorded teaching. And in right. the last 15 months, we've been to Antarctica, to the South Pole. We've been to the North Pole. We've been to Costa Rica, Bangalore. We've been everywhere around the world and we've been took a film crew with us all sponsored by this wonderful company called aurora expeditions they put us on their ship they said get on our ship we'll take you for free if you're going to teach the world for free so wow. we, went to the south, we went to the south pole the film crew i'm the teacher the camera's pointing at me in fact the best one is the north pole there was a polar bear where right behind me and i got the camera on me and i'm like this week we're learning all about apex predators and as you can see behind me, there is a polar bear and the polar bear is walking on the ice in the North Pole. And rawr, you know, this thing, 700 kilos can just eat you in a second. And we teach this lesson, this whole lesson about apex predators in at the scene in front of blue whales or 130,000 king penguins. We've done everything. It's been so cool. There's so, so much cool. more to go. 
But the whole idea of it is that the children learn. We bring the world into their classroom, right? So a child in Nepal is never going to see the ocean, let alone an iceberg or a polar bear. You might as well teach them about Jupiter, save Jupiter. They, you know, it's so far away. So we beam these worlds into their room. But then the objective, like I said at the very beginning, is they then go through this process of learning, but they then have to make the world a better place with their work, right? So schools are taking this on in their droves. There's thousands of schools just going, we're in, we're coming. Cool. And I'll cool. give you one very cool story, one cool example of what's been happening around the world. One story. There are thousands of these, but one that made me almost, I was drawn to tears, was that a school in Delhi, we have all these courses on our platform that I've written, right? There's hundreds of them. They're really cool. Um, and one of them uh, is about learning from nature. You learn from trees. So we flew to Bangalore. In Bangalore, there's the largest tree in the world. It's called a Banyan tree. It's the size of two swimming pools. It's It was around when the Ottoman Empire was around. It's 400 years old. It's huge, this thing, in width. We went there, and we teach a lesson under the shade of this Banyan tree. And the children then got to learn about trees and photosynthesis and all this stuff. But at the end, they have to do something real. So there's children in India in Dwarka Expressway, which is a a derelict part of it, Delhi. It's just dust and sand next to a huge highway. They did the course. The whole school did it. They decided they were going to plant a forest. So what did they do? They wrote 6,000 letters to a local minister who gifted them an acre of land right outside their school. They got 6,000 letters handwritten by 6,000 kids. I didn't tell these kids to do this. We just guide them into inspiring them to want to do something huge and go all out. Just you can do, do it. it. Here are all the things you could choose from. If you don't like our ideas, make your own idea. And here are all the ways you can engage the community. If you don't like them, you can do something of your own. But they're all real world, future focused, and they're all in the curriculum. These kids wrote 6,000 letters. They got the land. They then wrote 6,000 more letters to a businessman who gave them a loan, right, to buy the trees. They bought saplings. I flew to Delhi because they invited me and I went to the inauguration. On the day they planted the forest, all 6,000 kids wandered out and they planted these saplings in the ground. A day they'll never forget. And a day I'll never forget. But I turned to one of the 13-year-old children and I said, I was interviewing her for a little film we made and you can find it on our website. But I said to her, how will you know when this forest is a success? And the words will stick with me forever. She said, We'll know it's a success when the first bird arrives because we've never seen a bird here. And I was like, oh, my God. And she said, look, and she pointed up in the school window. She said, we've already started our bird watching club. We have a roster where children come and look for birds. We can't wait till the first one comes. And I looked up in the window. There's a little boy with a pair of binoculars. He's already looking. The the trees have not been planted yet. But, you know, that as an objective is, is amazing. So if if you can have that in front of children, you can do this. You know, if I said to you, Cindy, I want you to get some of your friends and plant a forest, you're like, yeah, that'd be worth yeah. I don't think I can do that. But if you're a kid, the kids you're are like, let's do it. The kids are like, you know what? I want to plant a forest. I'm going to do that. And so all of our content is all like that. Everything is like that. It's big. We call it in Montessori big work, where kids are taking on the biggest challenges in the world, but they're developing these skills for the future. And here's the cool bit. It's totally free. You pay zero for the whole thing. Um, it's fun. So teachers can go on there, enroll them in school, enroll themselves as resources. Teacher training, everything is there waiting, and it's totally free of charge, which is very cool. And we're very proud of that. Me and Richard just stand back in awe, like, how did we manage to do this? And and so now we're addicted. We can't stop. You know, We just continue to build it as big as possible. So it's very cool. <laughs>